Good evening to you all. I'm Susan Salcido, Santa Barbara County Superintendent of Schools, and so delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the County Education Office and the Santa Barbara County School Boards Association, just a wonderful represent representative group of local trustees from Allen Hancock College to Santa Barbara City College and the 20 school district boards throughout the county. For our colleagues who are unable to be here tonight, and for those who want to review this presentation later on, this session is being recorded. And we intentionally designed tonight's event to be a Zoom meeting so that we can see everybody and that presenters can see visual cues from you. Um, and we encourage you all to keep your cameras on, but completely understand if you'd prefer to turn off your camera at some point this evening. I'd like to provide some big picture framing on the topic of educator workforce housing before I introduce our moderator and that before we meet our panelists. In Santa Barbara County, we have districts in various stages of the process of actively pursuing workforce housing for their staff, and then others that are in a more exploratory phase. They're really gathering information right now. And so our overarching goals and hopes for this evening and moving forward are, one, we want to ensure that education, education leaders like you are at the table as housing projects increase in our county. Secondly, we want to assist developers and cities and counties and other housing project decision-making bodies in realizing the impacts that new housing can have on public education systems. We want to support education leaders so that we're all well aware of new housing projects and know the potential for employees to be on waiting lists to access new affordable or workforce housing projects. We want to help decision makers and key partners to get to know us and understand the nuances of public education, including exploring potential partnerships that could lead to workforce housing on district owned land. And finally, in our focus tonight, we hope to assist education leaders by providing information, resources, and local and statewide expertise on what it takes to build workforce housing for employees. So tonight's online presentation has been designed for us to educate ourselves on the language, the terminology, the parameters, and honestly, the complexities of this undertaking. Many people are chiming in on this topic of educated workforce housing. And on the next slide, you'll see that a recent Cal Matters publication called it our next new assignment. Right now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Bridget Boblitz, Associate Superintendent of School and Community Services here at SBCEO, who along with Cami Barnwell, um, SBCEO's Director of Communication and our Public Information Officer, have spent significant time researching this space to help package this presentation for all of us this evening. So Bridget, thank you so much for all the planning and preparation and for facilitating this evening's workshop. And once again, to everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Passing it on to you, Bridget. Thank you, Superintendent Salcedo. As Bridget, as Susan mentioned, I'm Bridget Boblitz, Associate Superintendent of the Student and Community Services Division here at SBCEO. And on the slide, you will see the members of our panel, as well as two key speakers for tonight's event. You will hear more about each of them as I introduce them tonight throughout the panel. Allow me to briefly review the key objectives for this session and then also do a bit of housekeeping. And so first objective up tonight, attendees will examine, will take some time to examine general development processes and considerations that impact school districts, workforce housing, We'll review common funding mechanisms and affordability requirements. We will learn about common milestones for a project, timelines, pitfalls, and roadblocks. We'll hear from two school district officials in Santa Barbara County who are navigating workforce housing projects. And attendees will walk away with some information and resources for ongoing conversations and considerations. 
Some reminders, as Susan said, this session will be recorded. Uh, there will be the slide deck links and resources will all be shared out following tonight's session. And at the end of tonight's panel, we will provide a link to a brief survey that we encourage you all to take. And we will provide a Q&A session at the very end of tonight's panel. However, if you have questions that come up during the conversation, please feel free to add them into our chat. In addition to what Superintendent Salcedo shared, I'd like to also add to this big picture thinking of the conversation to help set the stage before we move into the specifics. This timeline outlines the progression of important events that have led to the current conditions we are in. And then I've really laid the groundwork and created the momentum for school districts ability to explore building workforce housing at this time. So why is this timing right for the conversation? With no particular order, there are four things I'd like to outlay for you. School districts here and across the state are experiencing hiring and recruitment challenges. School districts may not have disposable income, but many have land that could be repurposed or reimagined for workforce housing projects. And you'll hear more from our panelists later who have actually calculated the amount of available land per district. There has been key legislation in the past several years to ease and facilitate the process of building housing for school employees on school district land. And finally, our county, not unlike many across the state, is urgency urgently looking to address a housing and an affordable housing shortage. I wanted to take a moment to just briefly zoom in on this map provided by our county partners. And according to their analysis, our city and county leaders have set a goal and identified the need to build a total of 24,856 new housing units in Santa Barbara County over the next eight years. These totals represent the projected housing needs over different income bands. And yes, this includes teachers, our classified staff. It really includes everyone living in our communities. As Superintendent stated, or Salcedo stated, excuse me, as we look at this potential surge in new housing, we as education and community leaders need to also prepare for the impact that this will have on our public school infrastructure, our classrooms and childcare facilities. So to help us explore this and many other questions, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to our first two panelists. In Santa Barbara County, there are two housing authorities, one for the city of Santa Barbara and one for the rest of the county. Rob Fredericks is the executive director of the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara, an award-winning local public agency that provides quality, affordable housing and support services. Bob Havlicek is the executive director of the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Barbara, which functions primarily to build, acquire, own, manage, and maintain residential rental units for people who qualify under the affordable housing criteria. The County Housing Authority is the largest property management organization in the county. A detail that is worth mentioning about both in Santa Barbara County, both of these housing authorities function as developers, which is not the case in all counties. And combined, they represent 60 plus years of knowledge and experience on the topic of housing and affordable housing. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rob and Bob. Thank you, Bridget. It just so happens a plane is uh, flying by, so sorry for the background noise. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, as mentioned, I'm Bob Havlicek, the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Barbara. I've uh, been executive director now for the last nine years or so and, and with the agency for 29 years. Um, 
So this first slide will give you a sense of the steps, and I like the descriptive considerations that uh, each individual, uh, if you will, landowner, landowner uh, school district needs to go through um, in order to consider whether to develop. The first is starting with employee needs. And so um, there'll be some more information on later slides on this. Um, but the, the real question is, you know, uh, is there a demand in your particular area for housing? And so it's important to survey to find out exactly what the needs are. And those needs include income level, uh, the unit size, you know, was there, is it one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedrooms, et cetera. Uh, also a consideration is the available land. You may have land available uh, that you're not cur currently utilizing. And so that's an important factor. And then the question is, is it suitable? Is it in a location that would be desirable for your potential employees to uh, to live in once it's developed? Um, then there's uh, considerations with legislative and legal barriers. You'll find out in a later slide that California in the last five to seven years or so has made a concerted effort to make it easier to for local jurisdictions to develop properties. In the past, it's been very easy for local groups to stop development of any kind, even market rate housing. Um, and so there are some tools in the toolbox that are available that help facilitate um, uh, the development of new housing. But I would say that even with those tools, you know, you certainly want to be a good neighbor, and it's really critical that you have an open dialogue with your surrounding community about what you're intending to do. That way, um, you can gain buy-in, and also the surrounding community, it's amazing the ideas that they come up with that can make your project a much better project. Um, and then there's financing. Uh, there's lots of different tools, and we'll talk a little bit later about those financing tools. Um, uh, Rob and I do a lot of work in the affordable housing arena, as was mentioned earlier. And we use low-income housing tax credits along with some other financing tools. Uh, but there's certainly other tools available, and tonight's presentation uh, will explore some of those. Uh, and then there's, uh, once you've decided, okay, you have a need, your employees uh, have a desire and you, you're going to want to develop, you're going to take advantage of some of the state and local tools that allow the development to happen, um, and you, you've determined that your project is financially feasible, you've got to select an architect and engineers and so on, and you go through the entire entitlement process, land use approval process. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I can't overstate the fact that the, the state regional housing needs assessment, we call it RENA for short, is a very important uh, factor. The landscape has changed in the development arena because of the state regional housing needs assessment. Uh, it's an eight year cycle. And what was mentioned earlier, there was nearly 25,000 units of new housing that are required for Santa Barbara County for all jurisdictions. I think what's important to note is there is a, a an attitude shift towards development now. Um, it used to be completely anti-growth, and I think um, the state has made it clear that it it wants to see new housing developed. And the, the local jurisdictions in doing their housing element update have converted quite a few parcels of property and rezoned them to allow for higher density and definitely more development. Um, and then finally, uh, once you've gotten through this part of the process, there's the project management aspect of it, selecting your general contractor, um, you know, finalizing the, the design, the unit mix, the income levels, and so on. Um, it's important that you have a project management team 
or that your developer has a project management team to oversee the successful completion of the construction. And then ultimately from there, the lease up of the units that are available. Um, I'm gonna stop there and ask my counterpart, Rob, for any additional comments or anything I might've missed for this slide. I think you've got it, Bob. Uh, I'll just continue on with uh, uh, some of these major milestones that you, that you mentioned. Um, we have nine of them listed here. And, um, you know, just listening to Bob, you might all go, wow, this is a huge amount of work, a huge undertaking. Why are we getting ourselves involved in this when we're educators and we're trying to educate the community's youth? We're not builders of, of, of housing. So um, the issue, though, is that there's such a great need out there uh, in all communities not not only in Santa Barbara, but across the nation, we've underbuilt, and there's there's just a huge need for affordable housing across various income levels. And um, and I'll go into it in another slide, but that's why it's a good idea to hook up with uh, an age a public agency like ours. That this is what we do. We take on that that hard work uh, of. Um, doing all those those milestones, the pre-development work, the the getting the preliminary design done, working with the city and the county to go through their approval processes and um, you know, getting the funding together. That's what we do. Uh, and believe it or not, we kind of enjoy all those headaches. Uh, we really get into it. So um, on this slide that you're seeing now, the first thing, that you need to start off with is, is there actually a need to do this for our employees? So that that initial uh, study of, uh, of, of your employees is really important to determine, well, is there an appetite at all with, with employees for this type of uh, affordable housing that uh, would be provided? And, um, where do they fall into their household incomes along the income streams? Because that then informs us, housing authorities and the school district, as far as the financing that's available for these units. Can we even uh, go after the low-income housing tax credit uh, uh, funding source if if all the uh, employees that would be interested are over over those income limits? Uh, so it's really important to do to start off with an employee survey, and that's what we did with the um, the Santa Barbara Unified School District. You'll hear from uh, Dr. Maldonado later, but that's that was the starting point, really determining if there there is an appetite for this. And the results of that survey really came back showing, heck yeah, there's a huge need, which we we all intrinsically know with the need for affordable housing it's it's a bag of hurt across all income levels now and especially low moderate and low income households and that's what we found out with the uh survey that the school district did is that there are plenty of households that would be eligible for uh uh a development that's financed with low-income housing tax credits, and they would also be uh, interested, and there would be an appetite for them to um, to rent these units that would be built. Uh, and you know, it's a huge thing. I know with school districts of my wife's a teacher in Wainimi School District, and for school districts to be able to uh, uh, to attract and then even to retain their employees is a is difficult across all jurisdictions because of the high cost of living. So if we can provide the the housing that's that's so desperately needed um, at an affordable level for those income groups, then that's that's what we're going to do. So um you know that's 
we really looked at it as, okay, well, if, if we build it, will they come? Kind of like the Field of Dreams movie, right? If we build it, will they come? And um, the survey is informing us of the decision to move forward with our initial development that you'll hear from Dr. Maldonado on uh, of uh, a school site that's that's no longer being utilized in, in Santa Barbara on the east side. It's a perfect place for doing this. And, um, and we are going to move forward with the development. So uh, I encourage you all to look at that. And I'll, I'll turn it back to Bob with site selection then. What you do after you determine that, oh, there is a need. And then what do you do with we're looking at the other considerations for sites? Bob? Thank you, Rob. Um, so with site selection, you know, most school districts are in the middle of residential areas. And so that's really helpful. So if you're building residential and you're and you have excess land at your specific school site, um, the the assessment is easy to do. If you happen to have excess land and it's in the middle of an industrial area, if you may be able to under California law develop it but it may not be in an attractive area. So that's really what we mean by land assessment. So it's important to take a look at what you have available and how suitable is it for those you're trying to, to house. So, um, and as mentioned in the slide here, uh, the feasibility includes current zoning, access to utilities, any offsite improvements that are necessary in order to develop your housing. Uh, because all of those things have a cost factor involved and need to be considered up front. Um, zoning is uh, just one other comment on that before we move on. Um, uh, the zoning uh, with the with the with the arena numbers, um, I think there's a lot of um, there's a there's a much more of an appetite with all of the local jurisdictions to rezone properties in order to see housing being developed. So now we can go on to the next slide. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Rob. Thanks, Bob. So um, what's giving us the ability to, to move forward with these developments, as Bob mentioned, is uh, some, some legislation uh, at the state level that's recognized uh, the deep need for affordable housing. So first of all, um, we've had the issue in the past of, well, we couldn't just uh, exclusively say that employees of, of uh, school districts will live here. Uh, that would have violated fair housing uh, laws. But the Teacher Housing Act of 2016 uh, enabled us, that was pat legislation that was signed into law that allows development to occur on school district owned land uh, for affordable housing that would can be used exclusively for um, school district employees. And that's what we're targeting on on the first development that we're doing is it'll be exclusive. I mean we the surveys show there's a need there. So we want to be able uh, to utilize all the units that are going to be developed there for school district employees, whether they're credentialed or um, they're, they're other staff of the school district. It's just they can be school district employees that live there. And um, there are other, uh, there's a multitude of legislations that have, uh, that have been passed over the last several years now because of local zoning issues that have that have kind of hamstrung developments. And a couple of these are on your slide now. SB 35 uh, introduces streamlined approval processes, uh, uh, gives you ministerial approvals of the design. SB 330 allows us to take advantage of state bonus density to create housing at levels that that serves the need. And AB 2020, 2295 that I skipped over is a, a further uh, school district land act that 
enables uh, developments to occur on any school district owned land, regardless of the zoning. So even if the zoning isn't quite right for building affordable housing locally, well, you can skip over that and you could still do the affordable housing because the need is so great there. Um, so it gives, a, gives you more flexibility as a school district to site appropriate housing at the appropriate sites. Now, Bob mentioned, we, we always want to be cognizant of where we're developing housing and to be good neighbors to the community. We're all about building community and being good neighbors. So we want to develop at the, at, at the sites that can take that, uh, uh, that development uh, density that, that's being planned and, and actually enhance the neighborhood where you're building. So it's, that's really important. But what, what I want to um, really enforce on this slide here is that the laws that have been passed that are now in place enable school districts to, if they wish, to exclusively rent to school district employees as long as the housing is built on school district owned land. You can you can open it up to to other uh, renters if if there's a need, but if there if you have the demand, with your own employees, you can exclusively rent to school district employees. So that's really important. Um, next slide. Bob, I'll turn this over to you. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh, so as was mentioned earlier, um, when you're developing a site plan, you, you've got to determine, of course, how much available land you have and then the number of units you would like to develop the bedroom mix is is obviously important the site amenities um, things that would be attractive for your staff um, um, and then um, the the available parking uh, the type of landscaping they're all factors to consider in a design because again you, you do want to fit into the neighborhood and you want to have something that's attractive you want the, your employees to be proud of where they live and they and you want them to take good care of it so um so working with your architect to come up with the kinds of elevations or looks that would be appropriate that would fit in and enhance the neighborhood are all critical factors okay um so funding um uh there are you'll you'll hear later in this presentation uh, from other speakers about financial considerations as well funding sources uh, i think for now it's important to know that there are a number of funding sources available um, low-income housing tax credits and tax exempt bonds have been uh, talked about in this presentation so far it's important to understand that those funding sources are highly competitive so you want a developer who understands how to compete in that arena. Um, uh, and there may be uh, opportunities for land swaps or purchasing of other land. Uh, because of the, the arena numbers, um, there, there may be opportunities that other developers wanna develop large scale projects and have to have a certain percentage of them, of those units have to be affordable. Um, and so there may be opportunities outside of school district owned property. Um, and then of course, uh, managing the costs of the project, uh, the building costs and the oversight of the construction part of it is, is also important. Um, there are fees associated with um, um, the consideration of fees, I think, really relate to impact fees from local jurisdictions. There may be opportunities to work with some of those local jurisdictions, whether it's the city or, or, the, or the county, to waive some of those fees. And if your funding sources include uh, sort of um, 
um, mainstream type of funding sources that are uh, used in affordable housing, um, you do have to be careful with the Fair Housing Act. And as Rob mentioned, you can, uh, if if the school district retains ownership of the land, you can have it exclusively for the school district employees, but you may have a consideration where you want a mixture of other tenants outside of the school district employees. And so that's that's a factor to consider. And so with um, some of the financing sources, uh, the Fair Housing Act, uh, which is a federal law, uh, prohibits discrimination. So you have to be careful how you structure your wait list and, and who actually is, is able to apply or, or more specifically who you exclude. So you do have to be careful of that. Okay, um, so this, I don't really plan to spend a whole lot of time on this particular slide, but um, you, once you have a, a preliminary design for your project, you can submit a pre-application for your jurisdiction, whether that's one of the cities or the county, and, and get feedback. Um, and once you have that, uh, there's technical considerations. Um, for example, if your property is in a a flood zone, um, th those are some of the technical things that you have to make sure you you capture within your design. Um, the, the fire department will also have some say because they want to have easy access to all of the units on your site. Um, and then there can be other considerations with uh, the road department at the county level just to make sure that um, you have proper ingress and egress within your within your development. And there's a whole host of other steps in the process. Uh, once you receive that feedback from a preliminary application, uh, you'll go through a formal application review process, and then uh, you'll address all of the specific uh, issues that were raised in that pre-application process. And then, then you'll go on to a public hearing, which is conducted by the Board of Architectural Review. And then from there, it'll go to the Planning Commission and ultimately either the City Council or Board of Supervisors for final approval. So that sort of gives you a high level uh, idea of what the process is like to get your project approved. Okay. Uh, and. I can't remember, Rob, is this slide mine or yours or? I, um, this... I, I thought I would take this, but jump in if I if I miss anything, Bob. Perfect, uh, thanks, Rob. So, um, so you, you, you heard all from Bob, all the brain damage you have to go through on, um, on start to finish, nuts to bolts, you know, soup to nuts, whatever it's called, on, um, on getting a project from, from a vision to reality and it's a lot of work but again that's that's the work that we do and we enjoy we uh call us crazy but bob and i really enjoy it so the the question might say well um why work with the housing authority on on development project ownership and management well um we we are good at what we do. We're very good. You're you're lucky in the in Santa Barbara uh, County that you have two housing authorities that are nationally known for for being great developers of affordable housing. We know how to do the work and we get it done. Um, and you know our our missions really align well as as a local public agency with school districts. I mean we're. We're my my housing authority's mission is to create affordable, quality housing opportunities for families and individuals while promoting self sufficiency and neighborhood revitalization. And we also have a vision uh, for community where families and individuals have access to affordable housing and pathways to self sufficiency. And we want to see that for every community member. And the school districts have th they're. They're aligned in that. They want to see 
they you do what you do to help community members to help the youth and the family and that's what we're all about at both housing authorities and um we know how to do this and you know when i looked for for years ago i i i talked with the school district because i would look at their their excess sites and i would say man that would be great for affordable housing and uh when when hilda came on board she and her board actually reached back out to us and said, hey, work with us if to help make something happen. And that's what we did to um, we started out with several meetings to talk about roles and responsibilities. Like I, you know, and we said, look, we want to do this for the community. This is what we're about is creating more affordable housing. You need housing opportunities for your employees. Let's work together to make something happen. And we said, if you provide the land, we'll come up with the with the funding to make the development happen. And that's what um, Dr. Maldonado and her team, their school district is doing with our agency on this first development is we worked out first an MOU and then we moved to a development agreement approved by both boards that that provided a, a the the clear and distinct roles of the housing authority to act as developer and to go through all those processes that Bob just uh, laid out uh, while still continuing to consult with the school district to ensure through this whole process to ensure that they're um, they're being informed and they're kept in the loop and we're meeting their needs on on all of it that so this first project that we're doing is going to be uh financed with low-income housing tax credits and that requires your property manager whoever you hire to have the experience necessary to be a qualified under the tax credit program both housing authorities are well qualified we that's what we do so um you know that we do property management and, and long term, we're going to be doing that with uh, with this project. Uh, school district could always if we weren't going to be if we weren't doing our job as a manager, they can go to somebody else. But we're, we're really good at managing properties as well. So um, I'm going to leave it there and uh, we'll go to the next slide. So thank you so much, Rob and Bob, for your incredible insight and wisdom. I like that. We get it done. Um, we are the guys that we want to call in this county. And so thank you so much for just being here. And I ask that you stay on. We may have questions for you during the Q&A portion of tonight's event. And so we're going to transition. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to three statewide experts on the topic of education workforce housing. We have Manos. Prusalo Glu, a researcher, architectural designer, and urban planner, who is an associate director of City Lab UCLA with us, as well as Sarah Hinckley. Uh, she leads UC Berkeley's Sitters for Cities and Schools, work on educator workforce housing and California policies on school facilities and Greg Francis, a senior project manager for the California School Boards Association's Education Workforce Housing Initiative. These three individuals and the organizations that they represent are doing the state's most groundbreaking work around what it means for public school districts to develop workforce housing. We are very fortunate to have them here this evening. So let me hand it over to them and uh, let's hear what they have to say about this specific topic. Thanks, Bridget, and great job on the pronunciation. I know it's a hard name. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having us. I mean, we're super excited that you guys are doing this and that people in Santa Barbara are getting more and more interested in developing education workforce housing. Um, the first thing we wanted to do here with this slide is just um, kind of give you all a sense that you're not in this alone. Uh, this is a map that our whole team, ourselves at City Lab, UC Berkeley and CSBA put together, um, demonstrating and sort of locating, let's say, education workforce housing initiatives across the state. 
Um, there's a handful that have been completed, as you can see here, eight um, completed project, projects across the state, excuse me, a handful more in construction, um, dozens more kind of significantly in progress, and um, 80-odd 80, 80 districts uh, publicly pursuing education workforce housing and trying to deliver this opportunity to their, um, to their staff. The other thing um, to mention is that you can see that education housing is a something, at least a strategy that's being pursued in many different regions of the state and many different types of districts. Um, we've worked with districts, small districts, rural districts, large urban districts in many different um, localities. It, it kind of makes sense and is an opportunity that's worth exploring. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So this is just an example. This is something that um, really primarily the Center for Cities and Schools put together. It was part of our initial uh, research report back in 2022. Um, and you can find this on the CSPA website. I think we'll reference that a handful of times, but there's a workforce housing page that has a lot of our research and uh, resources there. But what I wanted to talk about here is we put together um, this mapping software. So you can take a look at this map, both at the um, district level or at individual property levels. So on the left is the district, on the, on the right, at least on my screen, are the individual properties. And you can see a handful, a variety of information, let's say, that we gathered, um, both in terms of taking an, a look at what properties districts have available, um, loosely evaluating those properties for things like um, opportunity designation, which is something that um, the state of California designates different census tracts based on access to um, educational opportunities, economic opportunities, things like that. Um, we took a look at all land holdings that the districts have, put that in together into this database. And really, it's just a resource that we want to offer and think people should really take a look at to get a better sense of the land that they own. I mean, some LEAs have a, have a great idea of that. Some LEAs have, you know, significant real estate portfolios and groups that can take track all the land and, and think about what to do with it. But others um, maybe don't know about the little parcel they have or haven't thought about that particular parcel down the road as one for housing. So it's a really important resource and one that we hope you can take advantage of. And the last piece here, this is um, from our initial survey again back in 2022 um, of at that point, there were 46 broad LEAs that were publicly interested in developing education and housing, as you can see, or if you remember from a minute ago, when I mentioned that number has doubled in the last couple of years. Um, and this was taking a look at the land type on which they were proposing development. So schools own land of all shapes and sizes, land that has active campuses, active like school buildings on them, land that was a parking lot that's underutilized, land that maybe used to be a campus or a school that's now been closed, um, or even, I think Bob and Rob uh, mentioned this earlier, but in some instances, there might be opportunities to um, have units set aside for education staff on uh, buildings or parcels that aren't owned by the, by the district. All that's to say that there's many different um, land possibilities, and with each land possibility comes a variety of different pros and cons. Um, it might be easiest to develop on an underutilized site or a parking lot site because you know it might uh, garner less pushback from the community. Um, but building on an active campus might allow you to also upgrade campus buildings or to provide some other use on site. Um, so all that's to say, again, school districts have a lot of land opportunities. Each different parcel of land has kind of offers different opportunities in and of itself. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of excitement, I think, and a lot of possibilities for this as we move forward. I'm passing right. it on to Sarah now. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so there are you've gotten a really great overview of what it's like to build housing, what that process involves, especially for affordable housing. We wanted to highlight a little bit of what's distinct about building school district housing. And one of those, which Bob and Rob both hinted at, is that the financing structures might look different. Um, so I'm going to just talk. You'll have these slides for reference. So I apologize if I race through this a little bit, but we can certainly take questions at the end. Um, the categories of financing that we've seen districts take, and I'll show you some examples of, of actual districts and their sort of mix of strategies is these five things, cer certificates of participation, which is a form of borrowing that I'll talk about in a minute, general obligation bonds, which many of you may have used in the past to fund other facilities projects in your districts, um, the tax credits, public subsidies um, that Bob and Rob both referenced earlier, selling surplus property, and then conventional debt. So I'm going to walk quickly through these, starting with certificates of participation and bonds. So when you 
build your housing development, you will be charging rents and you'll have an income stream from rents. Um, assuming we have not yet seen projects built that have an ownership structure. So I'm just referring at this point to projects where the units are rented out to staff. Um, so most districts use a tool called certificates of participation, which is just a specific way that school districts or other government entities can borrow money to fund infrastructure projects, essentially by selling shares of the income stream that comes in from the project. So this is going to be dependent on how much income you have coming in, which is tied to how much you want to charge your staff. So in a market rate development, developers right, will use this entire income stream and charge as much as they think the market can stand in order to finance the development. In the school district's case, you're specifically trying to offer rents below market rate, so you want to be able to, uh, so that your staff can afford it. Um, so this wouldn't be as large of an income stream as, or a financing element as a market rate development, but it's still going to be a primary source, as you'll see for most projects. Um, these, this is a form of financing that can be done without voter approval. So this is something that the board approves um, and it would typically use, this is where the majority of the rental income would go from your development after you pay for maintenance and upkeep and setting aside some funds for, um, and for property management and then setting aside some funds for any long-term capital updates um, or, or significant maintenance expenses. Um, so this is one big chunk of financing for most of the projects that we've seen. The second big chunk is general obligation bonds. I am assuming most of you are pretty familiar with how these work. They can be issued and used for workforce housing. Sometimes this is a bond that's issued um, just for workforce housing. Sometimes it's an allowable use in a larger bond that might have other facilities elements. Um, and this, as you know, does require uh, voter approval and it typically, we haven't seen any projects where this is the sole source of financing. So this would be, um, you know, obviously this can be as large or as small as you think your community and your, your overall sort of district plan can tolerate. Um, we are seeing many districts who feel like this is not a possible financing option for them, whether that's because they've had to max out their bonding capacity to pay for school facilities, or they think that voters wouldn't approve a tax to pay for housing for staff. There might be a lot of different reasons. Um, so that will really depend on you taking the temperature of your district and making some decisions about trade-offs. Um, public subsidies are primarily tax credits, which I think we've talked about quite a bit. Um, also, uh, Bob, one of you also mentioned that some districts will sell some of their surplus property in order to have a revenue uh, source that they can then use to pay for part of the housing project. Um, we definitely have districts that have multiple parcels of land or divide a parcel and sell part of it and then use the proceeds to um, build housing on the other part. Uh, next. Thank you. Um, some developments are able to access conventional debt, which means borrowing money the way that any of us will. If you um, can demonstrate that you have the ability to pay it back often with another funding stream. So it may be that you are borrowing money from a financial institution in order to fund some of the upfront costs before you get the income in from those certificates of participation or other funding sources. Um, and then lastly, there's a sort of bucket of other funding options. And we are seeing more districts, especially larger districts that have the capacity to really develop sophisticated financial packages, we're seeing them mix more 
more funding sources in order to be able to construct a project. So if you look at San Francisco Unified, for example, they're stacking a lot of different options. Um, but I'll just highlight four that you might want to think about. One is that you could uh, have market rate development, either commercial or housing development on one of your parcels or the same parcel and use that to subsidize the lower cost housing that you're building for your staff. Um, so this might you might use a whole separate parcel. Um, Jefferson Union, which built the housing development that you might see pictures of later um, that everyone talks about, they are now building a market rate commercial and housing development that's going to bring in revenue for their district's general fund because they don't need that revenue to pay for their housing, but they could have done all of that and used that revenue stream to subsidize the housing, uh, the lower cost housing that they built. In some cases, there might be grants and philanthropy available. This is something that probably your housing advocates know about, um, the two folks that you've already heard from today. Um, there are local housing funds in some parts of California. Both San Francisco Unified and Berkeley Unified were able to get funding from city affordable housing um, pots that have been built out from charging developer fees or other tax levies that the city has used. Um, and then lastly, there might be other types of tax credits or public subsidies that, again, if you have the capacity to have someone explore what those look like, whether they're um, energy grants or other um, sources that you can use to help close that gap. So here I want to just draw your attention to Two things. One is that there's a lot of variation in how districts have funded projects. You'll see that certificates of participation for it all except for Los Angeles are one of the primary sources of financing. Um, two of the completed developments have also used general obligation bonds. Sage Park and the other developments that LA Unified has built are traditional affordable housing developments that have relied hundred almost 100% on low-income housing tax credits, which has many of the um, restrictions that Bob and Rob already talked about, uh, compliance with fair housing law, income caps um, that might exclude some of your certificated staff and other things we can talk about later. Um, and then lastly, when you think about the sort of financing development approach, there is a spectrum. We're seeing a lot of different variations begin to emerge um, of focusing on building traditional affordable housing as Los Angeles has done, all the way to a project like Jefferson Unified where they decided to use district funds or district obligation bonds in order to really bring those rent levels down and then give themselves 100% control over everything that happens in that development. Um, so they do have a separate property manager, which all of these developments do, um, but they are still able to completely control tenancy rules, waiting list priorities, rental levels, um, everything through a decision-making body that is staffed by stakeholders from the district. So that's the quick and dirty on financing. Um, and then I crammed a bunch of information onto one slide that you can read more at your leisure. Just a little bit about some of the, echoing some of the comments that Bob and Rob made earlier about the importance of beginning this process by really understanding what your community needs, understanding who is in that community, from your staff to the neighbors of the property you might build on, um, to the potential voters of a bond measure, um, to anyone who might be a real, really strong advocate for multifamily and middle income housing in your area. So we have a long, much longer development process guide that kind of walks through some of these important steps to take, especially at the beginning, to begin to build that consensus and identify those champions for your housing and then really understand how it might work in your community, what's possible given the land use regulations, the financing options, and what meets the needs of your staff. Um, and we also have resources available about these other two 
points about really being able to talk about what your mission is and why the school district might enter into the business of building housing and how that relates to your educational mission. Um, and then how to tell that story effectively to a lot of different audiences, whether it's at a community workshop or a board meeting um, or to your staff. And so we have resources and all of these pieces. I wanted to sort of put them up here just so that you're thinking about how this might be, how this might work differently for a school district that really has that mission of education um, that's a little different from a, an affordable housing developer that has a clear housing mission and nobody's questioning why you're why you're in the business of building housing. Um, so at the end, you know, you can ask questions about this, but we're also happy to figure out how to share some of those resources um, through Bridget. So, and now Manos is going to talk a little bit about what these projects can look like. Yeah. Um, so this dovetails, I think, quite well with what Sarah was just talking about in terms of uh, community engagement and also to some degree sort of um, generating community buy-in for your project. So fundamentally, and this is something that we think about a lot and I think is also part of the reason why we're so excited about this type of development is these are public projects built on public land and for the public good, right, to serve the needs of the school district to house really important employees who do great work in, in our neighborhoods. So as a result, um, at least we think, and I, I think it would go without saying that all LEAs who are trying to provide housing for their staff think as well, that these units deserve to be handsome. They deserve to be built in, in a high quality way. They deserve to be projects that are um, indistinguishable from you know luxury market rate apartments that you might find just down the street. Uh, part of that comes from the quality of your development team. This is something uh, Sarah mentioned. This is something uh, Bob and Rob mentioned before earlier as well. Um, working with the right consultants, working with people that have experience in delivering education housing, certainly, but also in just delivering high quality multifamily housing, affordable housing as well. There are a lot of people in California who have the experience of delivering projects like this and will make sure that projects look something like this. The next couple of slides, I think there's three or four slides I'm going to show, are all examples of below market housing. This is a education workforce housing project in Los Angeles Unified, um, really beautiful one. You can see, you know, contextually built, let's say three stories or less, um, nice facade material, this really beautiful central courtyard that connects all the units, um, single loaded units, which means that all the units get ample light and air. There's private space for all the apartments as well. So this is an example of a building that, you know, is affordable, is given at rents that are um, below what you could find elsewhere in the neighborhood, but is a type of housing that I think um, I would be happy to live in. And I think a lot of the people who do and live in, in live and work in LAUSD are really proud of. Um, this is an example. Uh, also, just a quick note, I guess everyone, all these examples are designed by architects who we've worked with at some point or another in the Education Workforce Housing Academy, which is something that ourselves um, Sarah and Greg have been heavily involved in over the last couple of years. This is an example in San Francisco. This is not a education workforce housing project specifically. This is a you know general affordable housing project, let's say. But I wanted to show it because it demonstrates how different building types can work in different contexts. This is obviously a, a much more urban context in downtown San Francisco. Um, but it includes, you know, I don't think give backs is exactly the right word, but parts of the building that are intended to benefit the larger community. Um, this nice open courtyard, there's commercial space on the ground floor. Um, it's built with this really nice kind of material touch that makes it feel like a really um, you know, strong benefit or addition to a city block, let's say. Um, the other reason why I wanted to talk about a couple of these projects is that there's kind of this pre, um, this bias, let's say, towards people thinking that um, affordable housing or housing that's not you know, expensive apartments doesn't look nice is going to be a blight in the neighborhood is going to be something that's not going to fit in or not going to actually enhance the neighborhood. And the two, these two projects and the next two as well, I think, demonstrate that that's not the case. This is a really beautiful project in Los Angeles designed by a, an architect we work with quite uh, quite closely. Slightly lower density example here, fewer units, smaller building. Um, but what I really thought was worthwhile in showing this one is the kind of attention to to detail here. This is the, the central um, circulatory spine between units that really like it's a it's incredibly beautiful and something that encourages social interaction. It kind of helps break down 
some of the thoughts and sort of address some of the thoughts that Greg might be talking about in a minute if we have time of it being difficult to live with people that you um, work with and all these things like having buildings like this that spend a lot of time and put a lot of thought into social space I think is really important and yeah last slide really what I wanted to show with these these examples is that investing in high quality housing mat matters our employees deserve that and thinking about things like having your housing fit into the neighborhood, uh, providing amenities beyond simply the housing units, um, building in sustainability strategies to ensure that the buildings are you know, energy efficient and, and make the best use of the resources, um, really giving back to the neighborhood and, and developing a positive neighborhood presence and creating buildings that are livable in, in more ways than one is really important. The last thing I wanted to mention with this one is um, this image, this rendering is of Jefferson Union, that new project 705 Sarah Monte that Sarah mentioned, and they're a really, you know, great success story. Um, they, we've been working with them for a handful of years now in the academy, and, and they're really, they seem as if they kind of had a process that might be a model for many other districts to follow. And one thing that they say over and over is when they showed this image, when they finally had a, um, you know, beautiful rendering of a, of a building where people could see themselves in it and they could take that to the community. This is when the momentum started to pick up. This is when they started to get a lot of support from teachers and staff and from uh, you know local administrative officials. Um, so I think it shows the importance of investing in this and the type of project that you can deliver if you uh, do all this right and with the intention that it deserves. Great, I'm gonna be pretty brief. <clears throat> I am from CSBA and really the first question is what is our role in all this and why are we doing this? Uh, around 2018, a lot of our districts and county offices were starting to go to our staff and say, hey, you know, we have a building that we can't use anymore, it's obsolete, or our enrollment's declining, so we're closing some buildings. Can CSBA, can you give us some advice on how to sell this off? How can we, you know, make, you know, how can we get the best deal on this? Um, and we want to get this money and also, we need to, we're having a problem with retention and attracting teachers. And none of them really knew about this option of education workforce housing. So, you know, our CEO, Vernon Billy said, hey, we really need to educate people about this and the benefits of this. So time has changed a lot since then. There's a huge momentum. You saw the map and we're all here because this is, has been a buzz around this, but really our role is to educate our members and just to be a place where you can go and get all the resources to figure out what your next step is. Uh, we are partnering with Sarah and Manos's teams because they really have that content expertise. CSBA, we really just want to be the, the first place you go, the clearinghouse. So here you can see on the CSBA website, just type in CSBA workforce housing and we have our resource library and we're trying to bring everything in here to kind of give you help with whatever your next step is. So. Uh, there, that map that you saw of who else is considering things that lives there, our original original resource, uh, sorry, original um, research report and the executive summary live there as well. As we mentioned, we have a training cohort and all of the materials we've videotaped and those are there so you can find them. Um, and we have a case study of all of the places that have done a successful workforce housing projects so far. So that's really all there and we continue to add things. So as people, as you ask for things, we'll add them. A couple of things we just added is, as Mono said, a lot of times when people are first talking about this, they'll, once you hear, hey, we wanna build afford you know, affordable housing here, people picture this blight and this thing that's gonna lower their property values. So we actually have a slide deck with images of all of the workforce housing units that have been created in the state and it, you know, people can use that and show that to people in the early stages and say, this isn't what we're going to do, but this is some of the examples and people can say, oh, these are really great. Um, and the other thing that actually really came up is that, you know, is there, a, there's a lot of myths. So is there a way to bust those? So on the next slide, we put together this myth versus reality document in coordination with our partners at UCLA and UC Berkeley. I'm not going to go through this word by word, but there's just, you know, a few of the things that we hear a lot is why this is not part of your mission. Why are you doing this? And we try to show facts and cite some of the research and some of the experience that's out there. So, you know, put that behind us so people understand, so people get that perspective of people who've done this. 
Another one is, you know, no one wants to live with their colleagues. And again, this is anecdotal so far. We're trying to maybe do some surveys on this, but most people say they actually kind of like this. There's a, a one that's testimony that said, you know, from a teacher who was living in a workforce development, they said, it's actually like all the good things of college without any of the bad things. And I feel so secure and supported and living with other people who are mission oriented. I, I just trust everyone. And there's, you know, it, it's, this is the safest, most secure, most like-minded group of people I've been with. And then the other, you know, big thing is LEAs can take this on successfully. And again, what we say is, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you should be looking at your housing authorities or some of these other partners we've laid out there. So I'll just leave you all with the fact that, you know, uh, please do go to our resource library that we, we do want this to be kind of the, the place where you can go to get all the information and find the experts you need, some of whom are on this call, but, um, you know, others, you may be looking for help with specific aspects of uh, in your community. And I will turn it over now to the the folks who are in the field. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mono, Sarah, and Greg. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise with us. And if you could please stay on for the Q&A session that we have at the very end. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce two Santa Barbara County School District superintendents who are currently developing workforce housing projects. With us tonight, we have Dr. Clara Finneran, superintendent of the Lompoc Unified School District, and Dr. Hilda Maldonado, superintendent of the Santa Barbara Unified School District. And I'd like to ask each of you to take about five minutes to really share an overview of your district's workforce housing project, along with any key takeaways, lessons you have may have learned or challenges you have encountered as superintendents navigating this space. And we'll start tonight with Dr. Finneran. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much um, for having me. And um, it was really wonderful to hear from our experts. So thank you. I do have to acknowledge um, there are a few staff members um, on the screen with me tonight. So um, a shout out to them, especially to Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Doug Sorum. I did see earlier, I think she's still here. I have a board member um, here, Ms. Jerry Teal. Thank you for being here, Jerry. Um, and hi to everybody else. I wanted to share really um, the foundational reason for exploring workforce housing, which I think a, a theme that has been shared tonight has been around how there is a an energy around this that hasn't existed in the past. And I think educational leaders, uh, myself included, had you asked us, 10, 15, 20 years ago, if this is something that we would have pursued, most of us would have said, heck no. Um, but I am so grateful to be um, in the mess of what it is right now uh, for three key reasons. Number one, recruitment of the best, most wonderful educators. Two, retention of those same people. And then three, the support um, of our community, which desperately needs um, affordable housing and excellent educators. So, I mean, we all know that when we have um, the most instructionally sound, um, emotionally connected and healthy educators, our kids do better. So that uh, that's driving our efforts. Um, we in Lompoc Unified, we were fortunate enough to participate in uh, CSBA's workforce housing cohort last year which is a group of districts that are invited to participate and learn and uh, start exploring workforce housing. Um, prior to that, uh, thankfully, I had a board member that pressed uh, on this issue. And so that's that really led us in this direction. So I will share a, a few things uh, that we've learned. The staff surveying is really, really important. Um, we did a rudimentary staff survey that showed us that 81% of our staff agree that the high cost of housing is impacting the education we're able to provide our kids. And secondly, we learned probably the, the second most important factor is that 40% of our staff have considered uh, leaving or relocating because of the high cost of housing. And these are people across all um, 
all uh, levels of experience and both across certificated and classified uh, staff. I think it goes without saying that um, a certificated staff member could spend 35% or more on their housing costs uh, here in Lompoc and that's higher elsewhere in the county. And for classified staff, they could spend 51% or higher. Um, so we went on this workforce housing journey with DSBA's cohort. Um, and right now where we are is um, we have decided to pursue uh, an MOU with REACH. REACH is an economic development um, wonderful nonprofit on the Central Coast, uh, assuming that this is approved by our board tomorrow night. And they're going to really walk with us hand in hand through these first uh, this first phase. Really important on this first phase that we secure financing that works for us. Um, and that's uh, that's a critical piece of why we needed to partner with them. We're pretty sure we're landing on this uh, this land site. It's a 12 acre parcel. That is a beautiful, beautiful parcel. It currently houses Maple High School, um, which is our continuation high school. We have been eyeing relocating that site anyway. Uh, so a few other questions I wanted to make sure I answer. We're looking at it being all below market housing. We're looking at the fact that we might need to have market rate housing in there, but we will most likely uh, have it be all below market rate. It's intended for only educators, that's our goal. However, in order to make it happen, we are exploring perhaps some other public service uh, partnerships. There'll be rentals, um, not, uh, not employee owned, and we're looking at establishing uh, a nonprofit arm that will uh, help us get this rolling. So, and there's a little bit more information there. Our, our latest estimate is that on the slide, our latest estimate is that we could probably have more than 110 uh, units because there are two levels um, to this piece of property. So there's the, the brief rundown and I'm happy to turn it back over to um, Bridget or to Dr. Maldonado. We can go right into Dr. Maldonado. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clara. <clears throat> Thank you, Bridget and everyone. Everything that ev that everyone has said here, we've sort of experienced. I'm not going to try to repeat it, but I really appreciate everybody's comments and Sarah, particularly you. I will be calling you later because I definitely have need for information on your uh, piece around financing. We started a housing committee um, uh, about a year and a half ago to explore and pursue the opportunities for creating affordable rental housing as well for district staff on district-owned property. And we have about four or five properties that we really looked at closely. And our main, our main reason was to attract and retain employees. We really think of how we're starting as being in triage mode. Like what can we do now, the quickest possible way that we can get some units built and the partnership that Rob has already mentioned is where we have, we're gonna be starting. And that's where we are, um, thinking that'll be like a proof of concept for us in Santa Barbara Unified. We did do a survey, like uh, Clara said, we have quickly uh, uh, survey respondents with 450 or, or more. Um, and we did hear from our employees that 77% of them travel more than 20 miles to work. If you know Santa Barbara, that seems like a long distance. Uh, we're a small community. Uh, there is 15% of our employees have said that they found affordable housing in our community, which means a lot of them are really traveling from Ventura, Oxnard, Santa Maria, and other places. Almost 53% are renters, and only 27% are owning property currently. Most re respondents, as was said earlier, are likely to live alongside with other district staff. We also did the same thing. We evaluated many district-owned properties. We have, uh, like I said, many others. Um, and our partnership with the Housing Authority is where we're landing this Parma School site that you see on the graphic here. We recently, you can see there the lot size, it's a small lot, 30 units, it's right across from a Trader Joe's, so that's a plus if you like Trader Joe's. We're going to have a mix of bedroom sizes. Um, the estimated project cost is $20 million. We are going after tax credits for this particular site. Um, and we're looking at about a 900 plus square foot uh, size apartment, which is a good size. 
We are insisting on parking. It's kind of a thing here in Santa Barbara that we're trying to get away from car usage, but according to union contracts, people can be assigned anywhere. So we do wanna make sure we have uh, parking and amenities included, including a children's play area, because we know we want families to live here. And we were very cognizant of needing some of that green space for them to play. Um, the other two projects we're working on, we do have a sale that's going on right now that should be closing soon. It's called a Tatum project where we expect to have another 100 plus units. We are challenged here with it being more for um, preference to employees, whereas Parma is completely employees only. But hearing tonight's presentation, you've given me a lot to think about to bring back to our board about how we can structure some of these sites. And then we were offered a land donation from another uh, entity called Glen Annie on the Goleta area, which could lead us to uh, build an additional 300 units. Um, and that's the one we're looking to finance a little differently. This is why I will be reaching out to you, Sarah, <laughs> on some of that. Um, and also figuring out how we would um, structure who can live there uh, and possibly looking at, I've had other public officials reach out to me, the Sheriff's Department to see if we can include not just district staff, but perhaps others as, as part of the different projects we're working on. So we have three things happening and we still have land that is sitting empty that we think uh, could be used for this project, for these types of projects. Uh, we've got nothing but positive feedback from our employees. And when Rob and I went to do the project uh, presentation to the neighborhood, we were initially met with a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know, I guess doubt from some of our neighbors. But when we talked about how terrible that property that's sitting there looks right now and how this beautiful building could really make the neighborhood better, I think we sort of turned that tide around. Um, so I, I, I feel like I'm learning more than I'm actually offering here tonight, other than to say we've done most of what you've said we could do. Uh, and I'm excited about just building more uh, projects. We are uh, somebody that employs close to 1,800 employees in Santa Barbara County, so or in our area, I should say. So I know we have a lot of people we would like to uh, keep employed, attract, and retain as part of our way to improve education for kids. And I'll just close by saying that I keep thinking of the poem about bread and roses and how you know everybody deserves bread for all and roses too. So we hope to make it uh, affordable and beautiful at the same time. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here, Dr. Finneran and Dr. Maldonado, and just sharing your experiences thus far in developing workforce housing and being uh, the first in our county to really lead this for your districts. So appreciate you being here and adding to the conversation. At this time, we have about uh, nine minutes or so, we'll say, for questions. So if you have a question, I will instruct you to, we're going to shut down the slides in just a moment. So I'm gonna instruct you to please use the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen and uh, unmute when called upon. And we'll uh, go into the Q&A portion of tonight's event. We can take down slides, Nico. Judy Frost, I see your hand is raised. If you would like to start us off with our first question. This may be way off base because this is my first experience into any kind of information or education on this. Um, I'm sorry, I've got a phone call I have to take. Anyhow, it was about people's self-help housing and if they're potentially a kind of partner with this. Okay, thank you, Judy. So people self-help housing. I'm not sure if there, uh, I see Bob, you look like you were ready to unmute. Is there someone who, Bob or Rob, who could answer that question? Sure, I, uh, and Bob can chime in. So people self-help housing is a uh, 501c3 uh, nonprofit affordable housing provider. Uh, throughout the tri-counties and they, they're a terrific affordable housing provider. So they could also potentially be a partner in the development of, of 
these types of um, needed developments. Thank you. Jonathan, I see that you have your hand raised. Feel free to unmute and ask your question. Thank you, and thank you to all. I feel like I knew a lot about this at first, but I after today, I, I'm like, wow, my knowledge has more than doubled on this. I'm so happy to have been here. Uh, my question is, and Dr. Maldonado touched on it a little bit already, is are there examples of multiple agencies partnering on a housing project? So, you know, mul multiple school districts or with the city or something like that. Are there examples of that happening? in case someone didn't want to go at it alone? Yeah, there definitely are. I mean, there's the one that's coming to mind immediately is this project in Palo Alto. It's 231 grant. Um, it's currently under development. I believe Abode Community Partners is the developer working on it, but it's a partnership between Palo Alto Unified, Mountain View Wisman Unified, I believe Los Gatos. There's a handful of other districts. And the idea is that each of them has some sort of an allocation within the building. Um, so they don't own the entirety of the units, so they don't have all those units going to their own staff, but it's a kind of mix and match uh, within that project. So that's a good one to to take a look at. Thank you. Another Jonathan, exciting... I, I think that the um, with uh, with the recent legislation and um, this current exploration, I think the possibilities, I don't even think we know, we haven't potentially Correct. explored all the possibilities, right? right? And um, so... I've taken the approach of talking to anyone and everyone about <laughs> workforce housing because I think we could get really creative um, with some public, private, nonprofit, right? All of that. Um, it's the potential is is really tremendous. Another one to watch. So Marin, their county mm -hmm. office of ed has a JPA with their county um, to build a property. But I think even more interestingly, the the county office is doing a convening like you're doing tomorrow with all of their LEAs to, and they're trying to bring them together to see if they can all do something like what Palo Alto said, where can they find the spot? Can they find the land? Can they do allocations? So there's someone to watch because they're, and actually they're meeting, it's the county office, the LEAs and the community college district. So mm -hmm. they're doing something tomorrow to kind of think through that and see as Dr. Finneran said, if, they can unlock some possibilities there. So Jonathan, you should give me a call. We definitely would want to talk to you about that because for Glen Annie, we still have to figure out financing. We have the land, but we have to figure out the, the building. Yeah, no, definitely. Let's talk. <laughs> and I see Molly Korea Walker. You've had your hand raised. If you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, two questions. One, just to to uh, note uh, Jonathan's comment about partnerships, which I think is is really a good way to go. Uh, something that came out or I heard from another report is that church properties could be another possibility for partnering as well with school districts that may, like our district community, the uh, San Ynez Elementary School District is a small district and we don't have a lot of property, but we do have small parcels. But um, partnering, I think, is really important for the smaller districts who are trying to address this same issue. And the other thing is what since we're school districts and state, uh, we have state responsibility. What does the DSA office actually impact our ability to move forward in many of these areas. Hmm. Mana yeah, said, you look like you were here. I think so, yeah. I mean, so uh, unlike with um, academic educational buildings, the DSA is not a entity sort of required to sign off on the housing projects. One thing we heard in a, in a previous conversation, I don't know if the people in this room feel the same, um, but was that it might be actually useful to have um, some DSA involvement in, in the housing development just because of your familiarity with their team, with the sort of way that they work. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a, as of now, no, the DSA is not immediately involved and not required to be involved with the housing projects. But if that is something that seems interesting, then we could maybe explore it and see if that could become part of the education housing pipeline. Great, thank you. Any other questions from our group? Okay, 
Then I will ask uh, all of our panelists, our, our panelists who are here tonight, if there is any last thought or message that you would want to share. We have about two minutes and we will wrap it up for tonight. Any closing remarks from anyone of our panelists? This is just something that crossed my mind because um, Dr. Finneran mentioned it too. The AB 2295, this um, recent law that was passed that Rob and Bob also uh, mentioned it earlier, uh, we think is a really powerful and kind of game changing law. And part of what Clara was mentioning is that in order to have your project qualify under that new designation, um, well, the law is, is powerful because what it does is it, allow, is it allows you to build housing on school district owned land without having to go through a full rezoning or surplusing process, which was one of the um, stumbling blocks we realized districts were running into with our initial report. Um, and part of it also allows you to have a mix of market rate and affordable units within the same building. So it, it's an interesting law. I think we're, we're really hopeful that it's gonna have a really particularly positive impact on education housing, and it might allow for these mixes of uses and partners um, that I think a lot of us are interested in. Bridget? I'd like to jump in with another consideration that we didn't discuss here, and I'm not sure if it's for this panel, but maybe CSBA could help out with, is this idea of the AMI or the annual median income for the community. As you know, in Santa Barbara, for us, it's really high. So even yeah. our highest paid, our highest salary teachers would still qualify for affordable housing. And one of the things I'm hearing from them, even now that we've given a, a higher uh, increase to salaries, is that they, some people, and not everybody feels this way, but some people feel like, does this mean you're sort of intending for employees to always be renters? And it'd be great to get some ideas and help around how we communicate that, yes, we should definitely pay all our teachers more. And I would want more than anything to be able to do that. But when you live in a community like Santa Barbara with, I think we're like the fifth highest rental community in the country for a small town, it's really hard. And it, so those two points are really important to make in terms of how this project really is intended with goodwill and good outcomes, but not intended to also keep people always renting. In fact, a student on my student council did say that to me. He said, hmm. sounds like a great idea, superintendent, but does that mean you never want people to own homes? <laughs> so I just think if any, you know, we think together about that kind of um messaging and, and annual income levels that are part of affordability when it comes to designating housing, it would really be helpful for us to think broadly about that. I think, yeah, Rob and Bob can probably give you those numbers for you. I would say that is something on our missing fact sheet and it's more eloquently stated there, but it's something like what we say is, yes, we do want to pay teachers more and we are pushing for that. However, that is not totally in our control. That's a state, you know, often it's a state level thing and it kind of influences the economy. What we do have is this land. And, you know, for some of our people who want it, not everyone's going to want it. This is something we can do. So it's, I would look it up in the missing facts. Um, and I also just want separately, um, I just wanted to say one other thing to add is this idea of collaborating is really, really important. So I would think of, you know, your county, your city, your, even your community college, like one thing um, is like a land swap. Maybe you have a, a, a portion that's kind of small in the middle of your city that's not going to work, but you know your community college district or your city might want to put an office building there. And if you they have land that's somewhere else that's bigger but could work, you know there there's just thinking of all the people around you who you who can collaborate. Um, that's really important for figuring out what's going to be the best fit. Thank you all. I, I know that others of you had your hand up and Rob, I see your hand and I, we have one minute and I want to turn it back to Susan Salcedo so that she can close out this evening um, for all of our attendees. Thanks so much, Bridget. Thank you everybody for joining tonight. I think this is an example of what we in education do, do really well, which is to share our thinking, um, ignite some thinking, stretch our thinking um, and really um, inspire creative thinking around this opportunity to better our schools, our education, our workforce, and ultimately our students. I wanna start by saying um, 
to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Hilda Maldonado and Dr. Clara Finneran, um, two dynamic leaders of two very dynamic districts in Santa Barbara County. Thank you so much for spending time with us this evening and for sharing what you've done and um, allowing us to learn from you. We're so uh, thrilled too, to have had Manos and Greg and Sarah, statewide leaders who have offered up your support to Santa Barbara County, how fortunate we are. Um, there's some good in Zoom and that's one definitely for sure that we could Zoom you in and share your expertise. Uh, Rob and Bob, it was delightful to have Rob say, and now to Bob, and Bob say, and now to Rob, and it's a it's a new show we're launching this evening. Um, no, I just to say that we have Rob and Bob locally. Um, your expertise is truly um, benefiting all of us. Thank you so much again for being here and for for just uh, sharing what some of the knowledge and allowing us to contact you later. I'm sure you'll all allow us to call you and, and ask for support. Um, and to the Santa Barbara County School Boards Association um, Executive Committee, many of whom are on online tonight, thank you so much for allowing this to, for allowing us to partner with you. Um, Bridget Boblitz, excellent facilitation. Cami Barnwell, thank you so much for all the planning and preparation. And to the team, Isabel and Delaney, thank you so much. Everyone, we will send you the link to the recording. We'll send you, there's a copy of the survey um, in the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll send that out to you as well. We'd really like to get your input and feedback. Thank you so much for joining us for our workforce housing workshop. And to all of you, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Can't wait to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody.